Hi, this is Michael Altos, and we are continuing our discussion of the endocrine system. This is lecture series two. We're going to talk about steroids, NSAIDs, and acetaminophen, and this is video part one. We're going to start by talking about steroids, specifically corticosteroids, also known as glucocorticoids. These are steroids that are genu that gen generally uh, synthesized in your adrenal gland, in your adrenal cortex. They are anti-inflammatory hormones, and the receptors for these steroids are widely distributed throughout your body. Your adrenal gland secretes cortisol continuously, about 20 milligrams per day as a baseline secretion, but there are many things that occur during the day that will increase your secretion in response to stress and other uh, stimuli. Steroids, like cortisol, have anti-insulin effects. As you would expect in the stressed state, your body will be um, encouraged to put more glucose into the bloodstream. This is called gluconeogenesis. And it will inhibit glucose utilization, uh, leading to hyperglycemia. The vascular smooth muscle also has a response to catecholamines as a result of cortisol secretion. So in the stressed state, we expect blood pressure to go up, and that's mediated in part by cortisol facilitating the response to catecholamines. Corticosteroids also have a little bit of a sodium retention and potassium excretion effect. This is probably due to a mineralocorticoid effect, um, working on the aldosterone uh, receptor. Steroids can be used for a number of different indications uh, when they're given as a medication, as exogenous steroids. For example, we can give steroids to treat asthma, and some patients may take inhaled steroids, and as always, I've tried to give you some examples of uh, drug names you may encounter. So Asthmacort, Flovent, Beclovent, Pulmacort, Adver. These are all different formulations that contain a steroid. The nice thing about inhaled steroids is the effect is relatively local. You don't have a lot of systemic absorption, and so a lot of the systemic side effects that we will discuss shortly don't occur when you take inhaled steroids. Probably the biggest side effect is that you could get some deposition of steroid in your pharynx, which could lead to some dysphonia or even a, a yeast infection, a candidiasis, um, in the back of the throat or on the vocal cords. Now for asthma, we could give parental steroids. We can give them IV. Uh, this is typically done for a, a really severe acute exacerbation of asthma or COPD. Uh, people have described giving uh, cortisol or some equivalent amount of IV steroids before anesthesia, although I've never seen that done. Steroids can also be used as an anti-emetic. Most commonly we use dexamethasone 4 milligrams IV at the beginning of surgery. Some people want to give 6 or 8 milligrams IV, as we will see later, that's really a tremendous amount of steroid, and we probably want to do everything we can to minimize the amount of exogenous steroids we administer to our patients. Uh, but if you look in the data, there's not a lot of data to support giving more than 4 milligrams IV if all you're doing is trying to prevent uh, postoperative nausea and vomiting. The mechanism of dexamethasone as an antiemetic is unclear. It may have some role in surgery-induced inflammation or perhaps increase the release of endorphins, and it is as effective as some of the more uh, well-known anti-emetic drugs like ondansetron, which is Zofran or droperidol. Now in diabetics, we know that, like we said before, uh, blood sugar will go up, and perhaps our diabetic patients, uh, we don't want to make their blood sugar go up. And so we need to consider the risks of hyperglycemia versus the benefits. And the only thing I would point out is uh, there's recently more and more literature looking at this hyperglycemia and suggesting that maybe it's transient and doesn't have any real effect on long-term outcomes. So that would suggest that it's okay to give the dexamethasone even to, an anti even to a diabetic, knowing that it will transiently make their blood sugar increase. Dexamethasone is also used in the treatment of cerebral edema. This is typically a larger dose, 10 to 20 milligrams IV. And this is very effective for reducing intracranial pressure when it's elevated due to an ischemic injury or due to a trauma. We also use it in the neuroanesthesia setting because 
dexamethasone will decrease cerebral volume and allow the surgeons to retract brain tissue in order to get better exposure to the uh, structure they're trying to operate on. So we routinely give dexamethasone for intracranial surgery as well. Steroids are excellent anti-inflammatory drugs and they've been used to treat a large um, assortment of different inflammatory conditions including post-operative pain, lumbar disc disease, collagen diseases, arthritis, skin disorders, ulcerative colitis, and acute spinal cord injury. People have used steroids to treat post-intubation laryngeal edema and especially in the case where prolonged or um, traumatic instrumentation of the airway occurs people will give dexamethasone 0.1 to 0.2 milligrams per kilogram IV or typically somewhere in the 10 to 20 milligram IV range. There are many many other indications for administration of exogenous steroids. <clears throat> steroids are immunosuppressive and patients who receive organ transplants all, all often are given steroids uh, to suppress the immune system. Steroids have been used in the treatment of respiratory distress system, syndrome in the treatment of leukemia and other certain uh, malignancies and in the treatment of myasthenia gravis. <clears throat> the reason we mention all of this is so that you know every one of these patients who may have been given steroids due to their medical background should be asked if they are currently or have recently been taking steroids and we'll see why that's going to be important in just a couple minutes. When exogenous steroids are given to a patient, it can suppress the HPA axis. HPA stands for hypothalamus pituitary adrenal. As we know, the hypo, and we will see in just a moment here, let me put the slide up. Your hypothalamus secretes a hormone called CRH, corticotropin releasing hormone. That hormone goes to the pituitary gland and stimulates it to release ACTH, acid, adrenal corticotropic hormone. And that hormone goes through the bloodstream to the adrenal cortex and stimulates it to secrete cortisol. Cortisol then goes and gives negative feedback to these first two uh, stations uh, in order to suppress further secretion of cortisol. So this is called the HPA axis, the hypothalamus uh, pituitary adrenal cortex axis. If a patient is given, let's say, 20 milligrams of prednisone daily for just five days, this can suppress the HPA axis. This axis, uh, due to all of the negative feedback coming from the exogenous steroid, will turn off this pathway and the adrenal cortex will have reduced secretion of cortisol. And this can be a problem in cases of stress. When the patient undergoes surgery or becomes ill, they may be unable to secrete enough cortisol to respond to that stress. And this would lead to cardiovascular collapse, which we would say is due to acute adrenal insufficiency or an Addisonian crisis, and this can occur with stress. This can occur after just five days of prednisone at 20 milligrams, and it can take up to a year to fully recover from this suppression. At lower doses of prednisone, we don't expect this to be as much of a problem because we know the adrenal gland has been continuing to make its own cortisol as well. So having looked at this axis, we can appreciate that as we give more and more exogenous steroid, then we're going to have more and more suppression of the HPA axis. What are some things we can do to limit this suppression? Well, if, we can, if we're able to give steroids every other day instead of every day, that would be better. Or if steroids can be given in some way that is non-systemic, so topical steroids, inhaled steroids, local application of steroids would certainly be less likely to cause suppression at the adrenal gland. So what do we do when we have a patient who tells us that they are currently or were recently on higher dose steroids? Then we need to give them some stress dose steroids. And this is a subject of much debate, but let's understand the idea behind it. The idea is, as we said before, the adrenal gland has not been working at full capacity it's been uh, turned down due to negative feedback from the exogenous steroids. And now when the patient becomes stressed during surgery or during illness, their adrenal gland will not be able to secrete additional cortisol 
and their uh, vascular smooth muscle will not respond properly to catecholamines and they will become hypotensive and even have cardiovascular collapse which we also call an Addisonian crisis. So by giving extra exogenous steroids we allow the body to maintain a normal stress response. There are a lot of different regimens. Usually if the patient is currently on steroids we continue them and then we may give low or high dose steroids and it's going to depend a lot on how much stress we expect the patient is going to experience as well as how much we think this patient is at risk for developing acute adrenal insufficiency. This is an example that I reproduced in your notes. This is just an example of how you might treat different patients. So we can categorize patients stress into minor, moderate, or major stress. So a colonoscopy is a relatively uh, low stress procedure whereas cardiac surgery would be high stress and most other surgeries would fall in the middle. And then we might say a patient who's getting five milligrams a day of prednisone is really very low uh, risk whereas a patient who's on 20 milligrams a day or more may be at relatively high risk. And once we've decided that we can decide how much steroid we're going to give. This is looking at hydrocortisone. And then do we need to give additional doses after surgery because the stress of surgery continues for days after surgery. And that would be true for a major surgery like cardiac surgery where we would give a big bolus and then continue giving hydrocortisone every eight hours for a day and then every 12 hours for a couple days and then a lower dose every 12 hours for a couple days all the way down to a minor surgery which maybe just a single dose would be sufficient with no taper needed. Again these are just guidelines. Uh, there is much debate about how aggressive or not aggressive to be uh, when giving patients stress dose steroids and in my practice this is something I usually discuss with the surgical team uh, especially if the patient's going to remain in-house and the surgeons are going to be managing their post-operative medications. There are some side effects of steroids you should be aware of. Some of them involve the electrolytes. So we said before there's a mineralocorticoid effect. This is the hypokalemic metabolic alkalosis. And think of aldosterone, which we said makes you save sodium and pee potassium. So the patient will uh, retain sodium and water, which can lead to edema and weight gain and hypertension. And they can lose potassium, leading to hypokalemia. Patients also may become hyperglycemic, as we discussed before. And other findings that we see on patients who chronically take steroids include the buffalo hump, the deposition of fat behind the neck, moon faces, this wide, round, fat face, abdominal striae, you can see the red striations on the abdomen, and very, very thin, tissue paper-like skin. Other side effects include osteoporosis. Again, these are more for chronic use of steroids, long-term use. Uh, peptic ulcer disease and even bleeding ulcers. In the CNS, patients can get psychosis, the old uh, roid rage, steroid rage that people have spoken about. And a lot of pe people who are on steroids have a hard time sleeping or may feel very um, manic and w want to get a lot done. Although later on, steroids can lead to depression. They can also cause cataracts in the eyes. And as we said, steroids are immunosuppressive, which is good if you're treating someone who is um, preventing rejection of an organ transplant, but it does put patients at increased risk for bacterial and fungal infections. Finally, I, I put in your notes a little chart that shows some of the different kinds of steroids, their generic and their brand names, and shows you the equivalent dosing. So if you know that a patient is taking five milligrams a day of prednisone, you know that would be the same as 20 milligrams a day of hydrocortisone. And you can see now that decadron is a very potent drug. Less than a milligram of decadron is already equivalent to 20 milligrams of hydrocortisone. So the next time you give somebody 10 milligrams of dexamethasone, you can appreciate that you're giving them hundreds of milligrams of hydrocortisone as an equivalent. And this column here just shows relative to cortisol, your body's natural steroid, how much sodium retention effect do other steroids have? You can see that decadron has virtually none. Fludrocortisone, which is primarily a mineralocorticoid, has very much. And other steroids fall close to cortisol. That's it for this video here. We're going to stop and we will pick up with our discussion of uh, inflammatory systems and the endocrine system in the next video.